to Psalm chapter 108. Music gets me excited about Christmas, music night, (laughs) and everything this month. That's wonderful. Enjoy that. Psalm 108. You've heard about the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on cancer. Uh, The Bible speaks about a war against the soul. Psalm 108 is known as the warrior's morning psalm. It's what um, would be rehearsed in the mind of a Christian soldier before the start of a day that they knew was going to have war against the soul. Uh, In reality, there's probably not a day that doesn't go by, that goes by that uh, some war against our soul doesn't take place during the day. And so, follow along as I read the verses here, and uh, hopefully we'll learn tonight how we can strengthen our heart uh, daily uh, for the conflicts and the trials and the the battles that each of us uh, will face Psalm 108, verse 1, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Awake, psaltery, and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth, that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand and answer me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph, who will bring me into the strong city, who will lead me into Edom. Wilt not thou, O God, who hast cast us off, and wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our hosts? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. The title of tonight's message comes in part from the first verse of this psalm. Our topic this evening is is a fixed heart and an anchored soul. Let's pray. Lord, I pray as we look at this uh, passage this evening that you might help us, God, to be guided once again back to you in a world uh, that offers a lot of uh, solutions apart from you. Help us, Lord, to be able to sort through all that and come once again back to the place that we know is a place that's fixed, a place that we know we can set our anchor down and it will not be moved. Lord, I pray that um, each one here, all of us, God, would be able to stand firm against the storms and the trials of life as they come. Lord, knowing where to go, knowing where to run to, knowing where it's safe, Lord, knowing where the harbor's at, knowing where the anchor's at. Pray, God, you challenge our hearts with this this evening. Be with the many needs that are here, God. Some are physical, some are spiritual. Lord, there are those not able to be here. We pray for them. God, we help that you would meet many needs this evening through the course of our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Brooklyn Bridge connects Manhattan to Brooklyn took 600 men 14 years to build this bridge, and it opened in 1883, and it still stands today. More than 30 men died in this project because of the um, difficulty that they faced uh, in setting the foundation properly for the uh, for the bridge, um, <clears throat> the designer himself, John Roebling, died, as did his son, who took over the work uh, in uh, in accidents uh, associated with the building. John Roebling's son invented a caisson. A caisson's a huge inverted box that they sunk to the river bed and then uh, made it airtight 
and the men would go down inside that box and they would work on the riverbed until they got to bedrock and then they kept on digging and blasting further and further and further down beneath the river, beneath the, the sand and the dirt, down to bedrock and then, then they were just getting started. Because John Roebling's vision was for a bridge that would stand the test of time, that would uh, stand against uh, uh, years to come, things he didn't even know would be passing over across his bridge, which they are today, cars and vehicles and far more weight than could even be imagined, probably, in 1883. The construction of the Brooklyn Bridge was called one of the wonders when it was built, wonder, one of the wonders of, of that, that era, the, the Industrial uh, Revolution, one of the greatest engineering feats of, of all time. Its towers are 275 feet above, above the water. So if you go to Brooklyn today or Manhattan and look at the span across there, what we look at is magnificent and amazing. And if, if you walk across it like thousands of people do every day and look up, you're, you're in awe at what you see above. But without the labor of what's beneath, not just beneath the water, but beneath the ground, without the labor of the fixing of that foundation, what we see above wouldn't, wouldn't have lasted very long. Surely would not be here over a hundred uh, years later. And the same thing is true in our life. What we see is one thing, but this psalm points out something that's going to stand against time and stand against pressure and storms and trials and afflictions. And that's not what we see on the outside, our body and our smile, and our, but it's rather, it's our soul. It's our heart. And before David, as the psalmist here, went to another day of battle, before that even started, his prayer to God in verse 1 was, Oh God, my heart is fixed. And it's only with that assurance of a fixed heart, right with God, close to God, that he dared step out into the conflict of that, of that day. To fix means to set right or to be prepared. And uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 57. It's interesting that the psalm we just read, these uh, 13 verses, uh, are repeated in a couple other places uh, in in the Bible, Psalm 57. Interestingly uh, enough, here as I was reading about this, uh, shares some of these uh, same truths. Look at Psalm 57, verse 7 through 11, and see if you notice some familiar terminology. Psalm 57, 7: My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Psalm 57 was written quite a while before our text in Psalm 108. In Psalm 57, David's sitting up in a cave. He's on the run. He's hiding from his jealous Father-in-law Saul, who wants to take David's life from him. David finds himself on the run and writing this psalm uh, of prayer to God. And in a cave, David probably remembered back to the time when he had been anointed king. And he'd been told he was going to be the ruler of all of Israel. But he didn't feel much like a ruler in those circumstances (laughs) in the cave. He had no throne around, no no servants around, ragtag army that he gathered up, some men that were loyal to him, trying to help him out. That promise of the king didn't look like any promise right then. Have you ever been there? We read about what the Bible says will happen to those that live righteously and and, uh, deliverance from troubles and trials and the goodness of God. We read about that. Sometimes, right while we're reading about that, we're wondering, when is this? Because right now it doesn't seem that way. Sometimes we even wonder if, if those promises really still apply. Sometimes maybe it's been a while 
and it's been kind of or very difficult. And that's where David's at when he wrote Psalm 57. He had to wonder in this cave, am, am I really going to be the king? But, but notice what he comes to in the cave when the circumstances are as bleak as they ever were in his life. He says in verse 7, my heart is fixed. And then though all, almost to reiterate it, maybe to himself, he says it again. My heart is fixed. My circumstances are terrible. I don't see the light of day. I can't see any way out of this, how I'm not going to be surrounded. But my heart is fixed on the promise of God. Turn to Psalm chapter 60. And we'll see in this psalm more of the same wording that we read from our text. Now, in Psalm chapter 60, things are a little bit different for David. Now he's actually king. Time has passed. He's king, and he's actually uh, in control. And uh, we uh, see this in Psalm chapter 60, verse 5. That thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and hear me. God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and mete out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Then the questions come again. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, which hast cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go out with our armies, give us help from trouble? For vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Some people take the fact that just about all of Psalm 108 is repeated earlier in two psalms, and they use that as a criticism uh, about Psalm 108. But uh, in reading this, a, a preacher of old time said it like this, Who would throw away a cup just because he's drank from it once before? And I thought about that, and I thought about, I thought about my, my morning routine includes this coffee mug right here. It was a gift from a friend, and uh, <clears throat> every single morning, this coffee mug does me well, holds my coffee every day, and just because I used it one day, and it, and it worked well, and it was good, why would I want to throw that out? Starts my day good. I like coffee, and it does a good job. You know, <clears throat> we may find ourselves time and time again going back to the same truths of Scripture. And they're still there. They're still just what we need. Over and over and over again, the miracle of God's Word. We can read the same passage and get the same peace time and time and time again because God is faithful and his words are faithful. He will never tire of us going back to the same promises and claiming them. He wants us to believe his word. He wants us to trust his word. He wants us in the midst of the difficulties to have a fixed heart. And he provides his word for us. Now look back, if we would, at Psalm 108, our text. And let's look at some of these uh, verses here in this psalm. Psalm 108, here the warrior's morning psalm. The Bible here says, O God, verse 1, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Though I have fightings and fears within, my mind is framed resolutely. It's said of that Brooklyn Bridge that it was overbuilt. A guy just gave a tour of it a couple years ago, and, and he said the, the, the builders overbuilt this. In other words, they, they, they wanted zero question that that bridge was permanent and would handle whatever, anything could come its way. How much more important that we take care of our heart and soul that way. There's nothing, nothing that affects us more than the condition of our heart and our soul. What is our soul? Our soul is us. It's the seat of our emotions. It's our personality, our heart, our mind, our will, our decisions all come from within, from our heart, from our soul. Nothing more important. Overbuild your heart. Overbuild it. 
make certain that, that it's, it's so fixed on God that whatever comes our way, whatever happens, our heart stays in one spot. It stays fixed. It's got a place of refuge no matter what. Overbuild, like the Brooklyn Bridge. Overbuild your heart. And there's ways the Bible tells us that we can do that. We'll look at those. Nothing more important than a condition of our heart and soul. Why would someone be so careless about whether every day their heart is fixed on God? Why would someone not care about that? Would someone start the day, start their week without God, without God's house, without fellowship with God? Going off that way is going off into danger. It's like going off with a building that that we didn't take the time to put the foundation on, just hoping that there's not a really difficult storm. Maybe that difficult storm won't come this day because there's nothing that's going to protect this building if if the wind really blows. I know because the foundation's not there. That's gambling. That's taking a risk with our heart and our soul, our life. So verse 2 Gives us a wonderful statement as as well after awake, sultry, and heart. So here music, music is involved, and uh, good music is important for the soul. Bad music is horrible for the soul. Listen to good music. Listen to music that affects our spirit, tunes our spirit to the things of God. Stay away from music that appeals to this world and the way of the flesh. From words that appeal to this world and appeal to the flesh, they might make you feel good for a little bit. But they're moving your heart. They're putting you, they're taking that foundation away. They're putting us in the ways of this world. They're making us susceptible to anything that comes into our life and just attacks our soul. The devil knows that. That's why he makes it so appealing. Good music, psaltery, harp. And then at the end of verse 2, I myself will awake early. I myself will. Well, awake early. One man said it like this, awake early in what sense? Well, awake, awake early in the day. Not just get up, but awake. Awake early in the day. Why? Well, this, this, this psalm represents a man in the morning preparing for a big battle that day. He couldn't afford to get up lethargic or just kind of ho-hum and kind of saunter into that day. He had to get up. And he had to awaken himself, awake early in the day, awake early in the service, one preacher said. Don't wait. Don't wait for the the fifth hymn to be sung to get woke up in God's uh, house, in in church. Wake early. Come early, early in the service. The psalteries up, the harps up, the music singing. Are we awake? What about us? Where's our mind? What are we in tune to when the service starts? It's convicting. Because we get service after service after service after service, it's easy just to take it for granted. I'm come here, I'm in my spot, I shake hands with my normal people, and away I go. And I did, did it again, showed up at church again. Good to show up. Keep showing up. I was talking with a man earlier this week, and he was talking about some ups and downs in his life over the last few years. But he said, one thing I never stop doing, and that's getting into the pew. I never... When whatever's coming to my life, I stayed in the pew, and that's that's that faithfulness is paid off, and God's really blessing him right now. But what about in the pew? Awake early. Why? Because out goes these songs that are just going to help our soul and strengthen us and fix our anchor stronger in God. Out goes the the the, the preaching week after week, the teaching, the Sunday school class. That's going to do what? That's going to fix our soul or not? depending on how awake we are. Awake early in the service. Get everything in the service that God has for us. Why? Because our soul needs it. Because everything in this world is going against our soul and warring against our soul. And we have true enemies. We have the devil. We have the world. We have the flesh. They're awake early. They're ready for you and I the second we get out of here. In fact, they're ready for our minds right now. They're at beck and call. Looking for any weak foundation. Did someone pull up their anchor? Got them. I got them. They're awake. They're wide awake. We ought to be too. Awake early. Early in the service. Early in life. Kids, 
awake early to the things of God and don't stop. Don't wait. Don't wonder. Don't say, hmm, maybe I can do that in five years or let me just see what I can do here. Find it. Maybe eventually. And before you know it, it's too late. Awake early in life and then awake early in our Christian life. Christian life. Get started. Get going. And you say, well, I haven't up to this point. Well, guess what early means from here on out? Right now. (laughs) Just get started. Awake early. Don't sleepwalk through life. Jesus says the night's coming when no man can, can work. Awake. Awake to the things of God. Awake to the Spirit of God. Awake to the preaching. Awake to the service. Awake early in the day. Why? Because our heart needs to be fixed with what we're facing. In, in, in these days, we, our heart must be fixed because there's, there's going to be enemies. The billows or us will roll, not maybe. They're going to. They're going to come. We don't even know when. They're going to. So what do we do? We fix our heart daily. We fix our heart. We fix our soul. It's settled. The Bible here says in... Um, In verse 3, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. We're bold in our witness. People know who we are. People know who we believe. People know what our life's all about. It's about the Lord. It's about Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're singing it. We're not ashamed of that. It's open. Here's what I believe. Here's who's changed my life. Here's who can change yours. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy, thy mercy is great. Above the heavens, thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, thy glory above all the earth. Verse 6, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and answer me. That's a command, a prayer command that David's praying to God. God, answer me. Why could he be that bold? Well, if David was working for his own self and his own selfish ways here, then that would be wrong. But he's not. He's working to get his heart aligned with God. He's working to be a testimony, to be able to stand against the the, the, the the flesh and against the world that's coming in. And so he can be bold when we're lined up with what God wants for us. We can be very bold in prayer. We can pray with confidence because we know what God wants. And we know that God wants our heart fixed. God doesn't want our heart uh, 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 unanchored from him. God doesn't want our soul uh, taken over by the devil and, and defeated by the devil. So we can be bold. We can say, answer me when we pray to God. Bold because we're doing what he wants. Verse 7 and 8. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. These are areas that were in Israel, and David was going to take care of these areas first. They were closest to him. He was taking care of these areas. But then we come to verse 9, and he says this. Moab is my wash pot. It's interesting there. Wash pot. Um, It's nice to have indoor plumbing, is it not? Uh, historically, we're in the minority of people that have had that blessing. Uh, not so back here in the days of David, especially David, who, who lived as a shepherd and spent a lot of time, I'm sure a lot of nights, uh, far away from anything that resembled uh, 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 conveniences, spent a lot of time out uh, uh, getting cleaned up out in the rivers and the streams, etc. But a wash pot would be something in a house, in a home, where if a guest would come, uh, they'd take their shoes off, uh, they wore sandals, they'd take their shoes off, and they would wash their feet, or a servant even, would wash their feet in this wash pot. It's for the dirty feet, the dirty feet of the guests, and the servants had that job. And David here says, Moab's my wash pot. What's Moab? Moab, personal to David. Okay, Moab's country, adjoining Israel bordered Israel, close to Israel, at times influences influencing Israel. David's relative Ruth knew all about Moab, 
and she wanted out of there. She knew what Moab stood for, the idolatry and the immorality, and she left Moab. And in the line of Ruth comes Jesse and then David. David had nothing good to say about Moab because Moab was the world that bordered his country. Moab was the idolatry that bordered his country. Moab was the immorality that bordered his country. And he said, Moab is like that dirty pot full of filthy water that you used to clean the feet of the people that come to the house. Turn with me to a Numbers uh, <clears throat> chapter 25. Numbers 25. Children of Israel are about to make their uh, trip into the promised land, but they've got to get through Moab first. The king of Moab, Balak, says, let me hire a, a, a false prophet, Balaam, to prophesy against uh, Israel. I want them cursed. And uh, Balaam tripped over and fell into the truth uh, miraculously uh, on accident and uh, couldn't, could not uh, curse uh, Israel. But Israel was captured. A lot of the people of Israel were captured at this time in history by Moab. Look at verse 1 of Numbers 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, because that's what Moab was all about, idolatry and immorality. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The world is working its way into the people of God. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Back to our text. Verse 9, Psalm 108. Moab is my washpot. David here, because his heart was fixed on God, he recognized exactly what the world was. He recognized that the world was just filled with filth. And uh, for someone to be deceived by the world at this stage in David's life because he is thinking godly and he's thinking right, you're being deceived by this pot of filthy water. The world is lying to you. The world is lying to us. The world is not the friend of God. The ways of this world are not the friend of the people of God. And every uh, generation that passes and every year that passes, if we don't pass on that truth, if we don't pass on that truth, there's going to be more and more casualties of Christians, particularly young people, falling to the ways of Moab. Because... It borders us, it's close by, it's appealing, it's an alternative to the things of God, and it will feed the flesh, when in reality all they're doing is taking a big drink of that wash pot water. What did I get? What did I get when I went after the world? You got filth. You got the filth of the world. It left you with nothing. And the world now sees you as filthy, Oh, you're, you're rejected and neglected by them too. David said, Moab is a wash pot to me. Why? Because his, he said that because his heart was fixed on God. And when his heart was fixed on God, guess what was real clear to him? The filth of this world. So why take the time to get our heart fixed and in tune to God so we can see how filthy the world is? We can see how silly it is to follow the world and how empty it is and how it's drinking from the cesspool and walking away laughing. Now, the people of Moab, there in numbers, uh, they didn't get judged much. No, but God judged his people because he expects them to be holy. He wants them to see him, and in seeing God, they see how filthy this world is. So what is Moab? What is the world? What's around us? Yeah, it borders us. 
It's appealing. It's going to try to reach in. We better be really clear that this world, like Moab, is a filthy wash pot. It's all that it is. How many people get deceived by that? Later on, David himself will have a day where he didn't arm himself for the battle against his soul. His heart was not fixed. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And he took a big drink from that Moabite wash pot. And his sin with Bathsheba, no doubt, God forgave him of. But how much damage did that one day do? Moab's wash pot, David's right, and it is. But you know what? Just like David, that doesn't that thought's not going to stay in our mind unless we're fixing our hearts daily on God. Because the world will deceive us. The world will deceive the elect that fast in one day, like it did with David. Moab's my wash pot. Over Edom, verse 9, will I cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph. Well, David had already beat the Philistines, hadn't he? Remember Goliath? That's a good story. I think it's on our window out here. Can review the story by looking at the church stained glass window. David beat Goliath. He beat the Philistines once. But guess who's going to keep coming? Philistines are back. Had to go. He had to beat them again. Same with our Christian life. We win a battle. That's great. Devil's not a quitter. Devil won't quit. Flesh isn't going to quit. The world's not going to quit. Back comes Philistia. He needs God's help to defeat them once again because they rearmed. They got their strategy back together. They came back. David had to fight those same people once again, but he was he was ready. Over Philistia will I triumph. Maybe the battle of the day was against Edom, verse 10. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, who hast cast us off? Wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our hosts? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. We do well to remember this verse. Vain is the help of man. We want to get victory in our Christian life. Vain is the help of man. Man might direct us to the ways of God. Man might give us good counsel to the things of God and to righteousness. But man alone can never solve your problems. The first person we must go to in life is God. You say, well, that seems so distant. Going to God seems so distant. And going to uh, someone I know seems so close. We need to work to change that completely around. To where going to God is is so close. Because I'm walking with him. And I've been with him. And I'm fellowship with him. God seems so close. And man, yes, good men, good good friends, they're a help. But even closer is God. And only you and I can ensure that that happens. Only you and I can ensure that we're walking with God. But you know, we want to get to the place to where God's so near. We've drawn nigh to God. And so he's drawn nigh to us. That takes commitment. That takes a decision. That doesn't happen just because. It happens because we frame our life that way. We make our decisions that way. And so here David said, give us help from trouble. Vain is the help of man. Verse 13, the battle of the day is about to start. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Fixed heart or no fixed heart. The day's battle is going to come. Fixed heart or no fixed heart? Ready or not, here I come, we said as kids, right? That's what the world's saying. That's what the devil's saying. That's what our flesh is saying. Ready or not, here I come. Let's, let's be ready. Hebrews chapter 2. Some ways that we can fix our heart and anchor our soul. David 
fought in his life for a fixed heart. Though the angry surges roll on my tempest-driven soul, I am peaceful, for I know. Wildly though the winds may blow, I have an anchor safe and sure that can evermore endure. Keys to a fixed heart, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he hath, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That's true, isn't it? We don't see all things put under him. Uh, one of my bus workers was telling me about a conversation they had with a little 11, 12 year old girl on their bus, on our bus, <clears throat> about her life and the decisions and the choices that she's making. And it was like just a punch in the gut to hear what she's, the choices she's making with her life, the lies that are being told to her uh, through whoever and whatever can lie to her. And she's taking it all in. And we look around and we see that over and over again. And we look around and we see like verse 9 Excuse me, verse 8, the end of the verse. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Doesn't seem like the ways of the Lord are they're actually hard to find in society today. So we don't see that right now. But what do we see? Verse 9. We do see Jesus. That we do see. We see Jesus. And for the Christian, seeing Jesus is fixing our heart. We see him. We we know him. We know what he did for us. We know what he went through. We know who he is. We fellowship with him. We see Jesus. We don't see good much looking around, but we see Jesus. Number one, key to a fixed heart is to see Jesus. Number two, Hebrews 4.14. 4, Hebrews 4.14. 4, the Bible says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. There's our word, a, a fixed heart. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So here we have these circumstances that seem like continuing billows over top of us. Jesus has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities too. He, he, he knows that. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Number two, key to a fixed heart is to hold fast to God in prayer. To go to God in prayer. You say, that's super simple. (laughs) It is simple. Because God doesn't try to trick us. He puts it out right there in front of us. Have we gone to God in prayer with our difficulties? That's a question we all need to ask ourselves. You say, I have problems. Have you gone to God about them? Have you taken your cares to God? I mean, you and you alone. Have you taken those cares to God? To God and spent time with God. He's a very aware of all of them. Go to God in prayer. Number three, we find in Hebrews 6 18. Hebrews 6 18, third key to a fixed heart. Hebrews 6 18 and 19. That by two immutable things, which is God's promise and his oath, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Number three is hope. Hope is the anchor of the soul. What is hope? Hope is looking off into the future and seeing God's goodness. Looking into the future... And believing God's word that his goodness is ahead. God's goodness. Hope. Number four, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 22. The fourth key to a fixed heart. Hebrews 10, 22. 
Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Let us consider one another to provoke to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The fourth, or the, the fourth key to a heart that's fixed is to assemble together with God's people. Don't forsake the assembly. If Sunday morning is important, Sunday night is important, Thursday night's important, the activities are important, volunteering and helping is important. Why? Because that helps us anchor our soul. Because the world has hundreds, I mean dozens and dozens of hours of our week, we're in it. The more in church, the better. The more, the better. Why? Because it's good for our soul. Sinks that foundation just a little bit deeper every single time. Because we hear God's word. We, we, we have fellowship. We hear the singing. Our hearts are in tune once again back to heaven. Our hope is encouraged once again, again in God's house. Don't forsake this assembly. Hebrews 12.3, number five, the fifth key to a heart. See Jesus. Pray. Hope, assemble together, verse 3 of chapter 12. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. Think right. Think right. Think truth. What is truth? The truth is the scripture. Think right. Think biblically. Don't think secularly. Don't let the psychiatrist dictate your Actions or not, think biblically. Consider him, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. And that anchor pulls up, and our minds faint, and we give up in well-doing. Think right. And then number six, Hebrews thirteen seventeen. In this war against the soul, we have some helpers. Hebrews 13, 17, we have some helpers that the Lord has given to us against this war against the soul. Hebrews 13, 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. God has blessed us with some people that feel the weight of our souls. And they're here to help us. This passage, verse 7, verse 17, speaking of spiritual authorities, humans, authorities that God has blessed us with. They bear on their shoulders the weight of our souls. And so, obey, listen, communicate with these people that God has blessed us with that help us anchor our soul. That help us fix our heart. They might notice when the anchor is getting weak. And they might say, you know, I can see now those waves that are coming in, they're making you drift. Before that anchor was solid and, man, the storms came and, and you were secure. You were stable, but now you're drifting. I've been watching. I've been praying for your soul. I've been watching over it. I'm burdened about it. Please listen to them when they talk to us. Please listen. They're not trying to win a popularity contest. If they did, there's other churches where people can just smile at you all day long and take your money and fly in their jets where they want to go. There's other churches like that. But thank the Lord for some people that care about our souls and are concerned whether our heart's fixed. They're, they're willing to notice and actually say something when things start to drift a little bit before they get too far and they're, hey, hey, yeah, l- l- let me talk to you for a second. L- l- let me warn you. And from the pulpit, warning every, warning all of us, thank the Lord. Get this, goes in with getting to church. Not forsaking the assembly. Souls are in the balance. Let me end with this. Two challenges to a fixed heart. And I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can. Two challenges to a heart staying fixed and secure. One is trials and the other is chastisement. So here we are in life. 
we find ourselves we find ourselves with a, a, a soul, a heart that's at at unrest. Something's stirred up. Something's not right. If we have sinned, and we have sin in our heart, and rather than facing that sin and confessing it, we just simply say, wow, I'm in the midst of a trial right now, then our anchor is going to get more and more shallow, and our heart's going to get less and less fixed. Because we're not facing the true issue that's going on in our soul. If it's sin, say it's sin and confess it and forsake it and then believe in God's mercy. But don't call God's chastisement and God's correction in our life just a trial that I'm bearing through. Will you pray for me? When in reality, we need to get on our face before God and confess what we've done as sin. So God can cleanse us from that sin. And we can walk on with a renewed heart. On the other hand, there are those who see every trial that their life is worthless. And they're just destined to a life of sin. And God's going to be chastising me permanently every day of my life. Don't call a trial God's chastisement either because the devil comes in then and he will take you to disappointment, distress, then discouragement, then despondency, then depression, and then at last despair where all hope is gone. And that's not who God is. God is a God of hope. God is a God of forgiveness. Some need to claim God's promise that he has forgiven his, their sins, that he has done what he said he would do, and step out in walking and, and, and believing and living by God's promise of forgiveness. If we've sinned, we confess it, we forsake it. We don't move to a monastery and take the next three years, right, taking a vow of silence and walking around in sackcloth and ashes, that's self-pity. That's false humility. Okay? And that'll take our soul and leave it permanently unanchored. So beware of those two traps. I hope that makes sense. If we've sinned, call it sin. Don't soft, don't sugarcoat it. Just face the sin, confess it, forsake it, and claim God's promise of mercy. And so those challenges for the fixed heart. What if our heart needs re-anchored? What do we do? What do we do? Some things here quickly. We repent and we renounce our sin. We return and repair our relationship with God. We refresh and re Replenish our souls. We feed it once again, uh, saturating our mind with God's word and taking big, long feasts on the word of God and with his people. We restore and renew a right heart in our ways. We remember and rehearse all the blessings that God has done for us. We remain and resolve in the place of God's blessing. In the end... We rest and rejoice that when we cast our cares on the Lord, he is God enough, and I don't mean that irreverently, to be able to handle those. He is, he is able to take those for us. And through some amazing, eternal act of mercy, he wants us to cast our cares on him. He asks us to. Psalm 116. I'm going to read this verse and, and, and we're done. Psalm 116. A great conclusion to uh, a soul that's been at unrest is this song. Psalm 116, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says this. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not 
be afraid. I'm reading the wrong verse. Sorry about that. I'm a page. I like that one too, though. I'm going to add that to my notes. <laughs> Psalm 116. Let's try this one instead in the King James Bible. Appeal to you to use that. Psalm 116, verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. What a day. When we start fixed, our hearts fixed in the Lord, we go into the day of battle. And who knows what faces us that day. The day ends. The night comes. And we return back to a soul that is at rest. What a life. But what if that day was really difficult? What if that day turned into days and months and trials for a long time? Every day to come back to the place that no matter what else is out there, I go back to that place of rest. Verse 7, return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from 